Thanks. I, I just jumped off an aeroplane from Europe, so I'm going to read my speech. I'm sorry this time, but um, great. Obesity, concerted laziness, or collective crisis? Fellow speakers, organisers, contributors, and colleagues, um, and Bendigo, I want to set the scene today with a few facts. Fact, almost two in three Australians are now overweight or obese, and one in four of our children. Fact, between 1980 and 2011, the age standardised rates of obesity-related diabetes more than quadrupled. Fact, programs like SunSmart, that some today would argue tell us what to wear, return $3.60 in communal savings for every dollar that we invest, and have saved thousands of lives from melanoma. Fact, Australian spending on prevention, which has just gone down under the latest federal budget, as a share of total recurrent health spending is in itself 2%, much lower than New Zealand's 6.4%, Canada's 5.9%, or our good friends in the US with 3.1%. Fact, last year our summer was brought to you by McDonald's, Joyville was brought to you by Cadbury's, and our happiness came courtesy of Coca-Cola. Fact, in a world of shrinking markets, Australia is one of the only growing fast food industries in the Western world. And final fact, moves to increase the price of junk food or positively influence what and how people eat are often met with calls of nanny state. And yet McDonald's spends $55 million every year, each and every year, and Nestle spends $120 million telling Australians how and what to eat. This is called advertising. And yet, no one blinks an eye. I was recently travelling for work, and within the same week I found myself in both Mexico City and later Melbourne. Beginning on one side of the world in my hometown and six days later finishing up in a very different megacity, this transition was one of contrasts, from fish and chips to tortillas and tostadas, flat white to cafe con leche. The food, the culture, the weather, it seemed like two different worlds. Yet as I explored the Mexican capital, one thing stood out to me, one common element. Walking the streets, the parks and the public spaces, a commonality surprised me about both of these incredible urban meccas. Throughout both Mexico City and Melbourne, I couldn't help but notice the amount of alcohol and junk food advertising. Almost ubiquitous, it was largely impossible in either city to take a view, a snapshot of the urban environment without the billboards, bus boards and moving advertisements dotted throughout the visual field. In Melbourne, the sheer amount of alcohol advertising, bus shelter after bus shelter, and on the other side of the world, the endless red and white billboards. Now, in countries where binge drinking and obesity are huge strains on the, on the healthcare and wider society, this got me thinking. What of the continued and passionate debate that we'll see today on the paradox between personal responsibility and the structural determinants of health? Far from a consensus, this discussion is often driven by conflicting ideology and political viewpoints. In short, the question is, does our fatness and our love of alcohol come down to stupidity and poor control on the part of individuals, or is something bigger at play here? Are people making poor but informed choices about what and where they eat and drink, or are they all being duped by industry? As I enjoyed my cafe con leche in a nation with one of the highest obesity rates in the world, I thought back to medical school in particular to our ethics classes and the concept of informed consent. To be able to put someone to sleep or even give them a vaccination, assuming they're not unconscious or their life's not in immediate danger, then a doctor must be very careful to ensure that consent for any criteria, for any procedure, meets three strict criteria. So how do these stack up when we apply them to our health choices in a time when the right is calling for government to lay off and let people choose their own health destiny. 
First, to agree to a medical procedure, the patient must be given all the facts, not just the benefits of the procedure, but also the chances of something going wrong, however small or unlikely. They must be told in a way that they can easily understand, and the onus is on the doctor or the provider to make sure that they do. Compare this to soft drink or alcohol companies and their interactions with consumers. Sure, there might be a small, a small warning on the label or a nutrition panel that, quite frankly, no one can understand unless you've got a nutrition degree, but it's hardly a drop in the proverbial ocean when compared to the endless information that is provided on the benefits of consumption. Does the company have to provide all facts and figures and risks? No. Does the company have to make sure that the person understands that soft drink is actually linked with obesity and alcohol with cancer? No. The second criteria is to be free of coercion. The doctor cannot force, mislead or talk a patient into having a vaccination or a procedure or manipulate them in any way. Now, I don't claim that companies force anyone to do anything, but the advertising I kept seeing was certainly misleading and sometimes manipulative. Sexy scenes of fun nights out, themes of health, wealth and happiness in a poverty-stricken neighbourhood or in Australia often in poverty-stricken... Uh, sorry, in a poverty-stricken nation or in Australia often in poverty-stricken neighbourhoods. Using children's characters and even our most... Uh, even our own names ironically, on the labels to get us to try their products. All on products proven to significantly increase the chance of diabetes and obesity. Finally, to have legal informed consent for the most minor of medical procedures, the person must be of sound state of mind. They cannot be in terrible pain or under the influence of drugs or alcohol and they cannot be a minor. Yet, when it comes to products like soft drink, candy and alcohol linked with serious disease outcomes. We allow advertising in bars and clubs where people are under the influence. We most certainly allow junk food and soda advertising directed at children or in view of children. And sure, in many nations, we don't allow the sale of alcohol to seriously intoxicated customers. But where are the measures to actually help people make better choices before they get to that point? Let's look at a moment at another powerful environment that heavily influences our waistlines. One seemingly passive but actually highly active environment that influences our choices as, as consumers and drives us in consumption. I speak of the supermarket. If you're anything like me, you can't get in and out of the supermarket without spending twice as much as you planned. What's more, what's more you always leave with three or four things you really don't need and never went there to buy. Those incredible bargains at the end of the aisle, those delicious sweets at the checkout, the cooled fizzy drinks perfectly placed just at the exit, or the most tantalising of candy at eye level and grabbing height. An annoying but random eventuality, or is it? Believe it or not, there is nothing random about the, the supermarket environment. The lack of windows, the generic streamlined layout, the long aisles, and even the bargains at their ends. Supermarket design is anything but random. In fact, your local chain supermarket is about as evidence-based as a medical journal. Layout is scientific, finely tuned and carefully crafted to make you hungry, make you buy and even influence what you buy. Now, I know this sounds like conspiracy theory and you probably think, ooh, lefty alert. But forget the little green men, this is the real deal. The moment you walk in, you grab your trolley, the experience has been purposefully manipulated to guide your decisions in a direction that suits the supermarkets and their major and most profitable brands. Here are three examples of what I mean. Have you ever noticed that you spend much longer at the chain supermarket than you originally planned? Well, supermarkets generally have no windows and as such, no natural light or reminders of the outside world. In a similar way that casinos have no windows, this is to limit our reference to the time of day and along with bland, generic, streamlined interior, encourages us to stay longer and encourage us, encourages us to buy more. It's also been shown, and there's good evidence, that brighter lighting may increase the chances of us picking up a product, and background music can even increase the time we spend in a store. Even spotlights at the end of aisles have been shown to increase the time we spend looking at the products under them. Number two are those chockies at the checkout, the Achilles heel of the shopper. 
Those sweets and the treats at the checkout are no accident either. Impulse shopping is again well studied and retailers know exactly what will sell, what brands, at what price and in what combination. Note the lack of no home brand options, let alone healthy alternatives. High margin, high fat, high sugar, high salt. That's the recipe for the checkout. Three is the science of placement, and this is the part that really fascinates me. Based on retinal eye movement scans from as, back as far back as the 1960s, products are even placed on shelves at levels and stages in the aisle that maximise interest and boost sales. Products which bring the largest profit margins, often the most calorie dense, are placed at eye level and even between two shelves of essentials to ensure that they're seen by every shopper. Even within the store itself, staples and perishable items have long been placed at the very rear of the store. And this ensures that we walk, that when we go to get our daily milk and eggs, we pass the chocolate, the cakes and the ice cream on the way. Again, all based on solid evidence, not at the store manager's hunch, and with the result of high consumption from an unprepared and unaware consumer. What about those discounts at the aisle's ends? Chosen and stocked with precision, combination of products are carefully paired and cases are filled to ensure that products, whilst being discounted, don't appear cheap. Researchers also know that by placing discounted cake mix with cake icing or crisps near the soft drink, always together, we increase the sale of both. We go to buy one or very often neither. We realise it would be better to have both and end up taking both home. Finally, even aisle lengths are not random. Studies have been shown and the verdicts are in. The longer the aisles, the more products one has to pass to get to what you actually want. But if it's too long, we know that the consumers won't walk down them. It's all a careful formula. Now, there's not necessarily anything wrong with the fact that supermarkets are being designed to increase consumption and manipulate our buying habits. It's their space and it's their profit margins. But we'd better be aware and understand the outcomes. So next time you walk into the supermarket, reflect for a moment on what is placed where and how this influences your choice. Be under no false pretenses. The supermarket environment and the food environment more, more generally is a finely crafted science-based environment and not a collection of products, all aiming to increase our consumption. And the result of these and other examples in short is obesity and obesity-related diseases. Diseases like heart disease, diabetes and cancers, which constitute the largest contributor to deaths in Australia and are expected to significantly increase by 2030. Now, these are not diseases of rich, old, white, lazy men. Obesity-related diseases cause, result in and entrench poverty with highest rates in rural and regional Australia. And with the poorest in our community, bearing the largest brunt of morbidity and mortality. Now, I could go on and I could rant, and I have been known to, but in 2015, we need to wake up as a community and see what is really going on here. When the government gets involved and counters or limits the power or influence of industry, it's not about banning anything or taking anyone's rights away. This is about simply levelling a very unbiased playing field, heavily influenced, by those with one agenda, consumption. As a community, we must begin to support our governments on action which limit the profits of companies at the expense of populations and our health. Ask why we allow McDonald's to saturate poorer neighbourhoods, but don't demand that those same neighbourhoods have adequate, accessible access to fresh food alternatives. Ask why we allow predatory, purposeful and pernicious marketing to children by Coke and others in TV times when we know and they know that children are watching alone and for products that we all know cause disease. Ask why we don't have food literacy as a mandated part of our national curriculums and challenge government when they put childhood obesity down to poor parenting and insult to us. As community leaders and concerned citizens, we must realise that industry, good or bad, is by definition driven by profit. And in this light, not continue to conflate the role of government with the role of big business, even if they sometimes conflate the roles for each other. The two are not the same and each have very different metrics of success and responsibilities. 
Let me say it very clearly. Big business is only responsible to their shareholders and bringing purely economic returns or sales, also known as consumption. Governments are meant to be responsible to us. So when we allow big business to get involved in setting the health, public health, environmental or political agendas, or we stop the government from regulating industries built on profits that have the ability to make us sick, we cannot expect anything other than that which will help their financial bottom line. They're mandated to do so. And this equals obesity. To, grow, to close, the growing and enormous national burden of obesity is no simple crisis. The causes are many and diverse, and the solutions must be similarly nuanced. But one thing is clear when we look around today. This is not a problem of a select lazy few. We have not changed dramatically as a species or even as a society in the last 20 years, yet the burden of obesity has ridden sharply and unprecedentedly, and the resulting disease even more so. With this in mind, we must realise that the thing that has changed in the last 20 years is the food and societal environments around us. An explosion of unhealthy food options, globalised food companies, and clever, ubiquitous food advertising based on strong, effective, known science. These are not problems solved simply by telling people to eat well or scolding them for being fat. These are systematic, systemic issues that can and must be solved as a collective. This takes regulation, legislation, and even, dare I say it, taxation. I'm not saying that we've all been brainwashed and that we can take no responsibility for what we eat or drink but when we have almost no uh, health education, health literacy education or worse, we rely on the industry for this. When we are ill-equipped to critically navigate the advert-laden urban landscape. When we are bombarded with pre predatory advertising and the, risk, and the risks are written in tiny letters with almost comical brevity. And when we're hooked as children on these products and indoctrinated into a culture of wanting them long before we have the insight and the critical thinking ability to be able to question it, is it really about personal choice? Is it really just about choosing to eat healthier, be thinner and drink less? At a time when two thirds of Australians and many other countries around the world are overweight or obese, does this rapid and unprecedented rise come down to a lack of insight, intelligence, or personal control on the individuals. Is it simply our fault we're fat? I don't think so. Thank you.